get quiet because we're talking about stewardship, okay? Praise team does a great job. I appreciate them and their service every single week. I want to take a couple of verses today as we continue our talk about stewardship. And stewardship should not be a thing we don't like talking about. Stewardship should be something we're excited about, uh, that we're happy about. Because God allows us not to be an owner, but to be a manager. For everything you have belongs to God. Amen? Amen. You didn't earn anything. You think you may have, but you worked hard. I understand that. But God has made it possible for you to have everything you have today in life, job, stuff, whatever. So, it all belongs to God. So, God's given us the opportunity to be a manager of all He's given to us. So, I want to talk today about the biblical foundation. In the book of 1 Peter 4.10, Peter the disciple wrote on this place the Holy Spirit some very important words. He said, each one, now he's talking about the disciple. Not talking about lost people, talking about the disciple, the one who knows Christ. <coughs> Each one disciple should use whatever gift, that means a spiritual gift. Now, let's hold a minute. There are some people that have said throughout the time I've been a pastor, well, I don't have a spiritual gift. Well, you're not saved then. If you're saved, you have at least one spiritual gift. Out of the book Corinthians talks about that, 1 Corinthians. And some have more than one gift. And the gifts are given by God's grace for you to serve Him through His church and ministry. Okay? So Peter's talking about that. He says, whatever gift, spiritual gift, He has received to serve others. We exist to serve others. Not self, but others. It's not narcissism. It's selflessness. We are called to serve. We receive gifts for serving. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Now what does that mean? Well, let's read from the New King James Version and get a little better understanding. Each one has received a gift. That's clear. Minister it to one another. Clear. As good stewards or good managers of the manifold grace of God. That means the gift that God gives to you can be used in many ways to exhibit and demonstrate God's grace that somebody else can see Jesus Christ in you and be blessed because of your ministry. I ask you a question. Who is being blessed by your ministry? For years, churches thought, well, that's the pastor's job. He's the minister. No, 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 no. No, let me add no, no to that. No, no. All of us, if you're born again, are called to be ministers to the glory of the gospel of Christ. We're ambassadors for Him. Now, the pastor has a role of being, a, I think, player coach and called by God, but we all are called to minister with our spiritual gifts for the glory of God. Okay? Now, question one. What is God's purpose for giving gifts to me? I began to think this week, well, let's ask ourselves some questions that we shouldn't just take for granted. Why did God give me gifts? Well, the answer is simple. To serve others and manage grace. To serve God. To serve others and manage grace. Think of a body in your mind. A physical outline of a body. And, and, and imagine that Jesus Christ is the head of that body. The church. And then you've got arms and eyes and legs. And different bodily functions. Everyone that belongs to that body has one or more gifts to make that body serve and function properly. But, if someone doesn't serve in that body, they lose an arm. If they don't serve in that body, they lose an eye. And the body can't function like it's supposed to. That's the reason instead of hitting on eight cylinders, a lot of churches hit on four cylinders. To hit on eight cylinders, all of us have got to use our gift of service for the Lord. Okay? Everybody got that? I can't go to point two to get that. Everybody got it? So if you want to have a hope of eating today, you better get it. Okay? Got it? Got it. All right, very good. It's going to be a quiz at the end and not on the curve either. Okay. Now, I wanted to demonstrate this on this scripture verse. And John, I think we have missing part of that verse there. But it says basically, do you not know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? It's bought with a price. Bought with a price. And I want you to see today that 
This is the, the disciples' body. I kind of made it look like a church outside of a church house. But if we're a born again child of God, our body is a temple of God. No longer do we worship at a tabernacle. No longer do we worship at a physical temple. For our body has become the temple of God, and therefore our house, our body, our temple is filled with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, the Holy Spirit does not like to live in a dirty house. So to keep your house clean, you've got to confess your sin. Confession is God's process for us getting rid of the filth and dirt and grime and sin in our life. And once that is confessed and forgiven, the Spirit can flow in us and through us in a great way. Part of people's problems as a believer is they don't confess their sin, they don't repent of their sin, so they have spiritual blockages. And so the Spirit cannot flow, cannot move, and there's no power. You see, if we have sin blocking the Spirit in our life, and sin will block the Spirit, we don't have the power in our life we need to have. So, question two would be this. How do we glorify God? Not with gifts, not with talent, obedience. The Bible says it's more blessed to obey the Lord than give Him many gifts. That's a paraphrase. So, we are to obey the Lord. Well, what do you mean? Well, let me say it in a different way. Obey the Lord. Well, what do you mean? Let me say it in a different way. Obey the Lord. Well, let me say it so we all understand it. Obey the Lord. Obedience. Your child comes to you. You tell them what to do. And they say that magic question to you as a parent. Why? Because I said so. That's a universal answer, young people. Because I said so. It carries authority. It carries a lot of weight. It carries a checkbook. <laughs> because I said so. Because I'm your parent. I am not your buddy. I'm your parent. Sometimes your child's not going to like you very much. That's a good thing. That means you're doing your job. My mother said to me all the time, go do this. I would say, why? Most times she wouldn't even answer me. Because I knew the answer. Because I said so. See, a godly parent tells their child what to do because they love their child. And the godly parent doesn't love their child enough to tell them the right thing to do. Even if they don't like it, they don't really love their kid. Because if you love God, guess what? Hello, you with me? you got to obey God. Amen. Everybody got that? Amen. If you love God, you obey God. If God says, do this, we do that. Why? Because God said so. <laughs> Are you going to question God? Hello? I I'm not going to question the burning bush, okay? I'm not going to question Christ walking on water. I'm not going to question the empty tomb. If he can do all that stuff, hey, whatever he says goes. Now, do we always obey the Lord? No. When we don't obey the Lord, guess what that's called? Sin. Amen. We sin a lot, don't we? How many times do we obey the Lord? The Lord says, go do this. We say, we may not vocalize this, but we say in our heart, why? Because I said so. Now, most time God tells us things for our own benefit, to help us grow, to be safe, to be careful, because He doesn't want us playing in the street. How many of y'all want your kids playing in the street? No, you don't. Because you might get hurt. If you have a fenced yard, what do you say to your child? Stay inside the fence. Well, dogs, you need to know about dogs today. I love my neighbors. Well, that's not exactly right. I, I attempt to love my neighbors. One neighbor's got seven wolfhounds. No. Four wolfhounds. A, a retriever. And a, and a little bitty dog of some sort. Now, when you've got wolfhounds, and you've got this uh, retriever, they tend to dig holes around the fence, you know what And that little dog can slip out of that hole in the, in, through the fence. So he spends a lot of his life in my yard. 
Okay? That's okay. He's a cute little dog, and he doesn't bark anywhere like the rest of them do. He, he, he barks, but not, not big. So, so I told her yesterday, I said, hey, hey, uh, Miss So-and-so, she's a nice neighbor. I said, your dog is in my backyard. Oh, she felt so bad. And we had to talk about dogs, and I, I didn't, I, I wouldn't be nasty, but I said, she said, well, does the barking, she asked me a question. She said, does the, my dog's barking bother you? And I thought about that a minute. What do I say? And I said, you mean when they start at 1.30 in the morning? They all bark together? I said, not too bad, but when the other seven on the other side chime in with them, and I've got a dog pound, I said, I kind of see my property as a neutral zone, like in Star Trek. This is like the neutral zone, and I have no dogs. So they've got kind of like a, a neutral zone, so they can bark, and they can bark, and they can bark, but my, my, I have a buffer zone there. So I said, no, it doesn't really bother me at 1.30 in the morning. I'm up normally anyway. <laughs> Why? Praying for you, you know? It takes time. <laughs> so anyway, uh, 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 this little dog got in my yard and he couldn't get out. <laughs> I mean, he can get out of her yard, he can't get out of my yard. I don't even know how he got in my yard. So he gets in my yard and the little, little thing is just trying to all, he's about this tall. And he's like standing up with his neck stretched so everybody can see him. So I said, well, your dog's in my yard, no problem. But I'm afraid he might get the other side, get hurt by the other dogs. And I really been true about that. So she, she went over to the pen and said, I, I swear she said this. She said, you want to come out? You want to come out? I'm thinking, well, yeah, he wants to come out. I want him out. Sure he wants to come out. He's jumping up and down. He wants to get out. He's excited. He wants out there. Do you want to come out? And I said to myself, you don't want that gate? No, I won't do anything, but... So she opened the gate, and boy, a little dog just flew out of there, and he was so happy to be set free from prison. Are you happy this morning to be set free from prison? How many of us spend our time locked into a gate? We say we want to be free in the Lord, yet we don't want to follow His rules. She told that dog, don't leave the yard. That dog left the yard. Now, you know, I know what you're thinking. Dogs don't understand stuff. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. He knew he wasn't in his yard. He knew he was in my yard. He was basking in the glory of being free from those big old dogs. I mean, these big old dogs have to have to be sure and miss him, not step on him. You know, they're this tall. And he was just over there running around happy, wasn't worried about the big dogs. He didn't care he was in the preacher's yard. He was just set free. God wants us to be set free. Now look here. You say, is there a point that's madness? Yes. If you obey the Lord, it will work out right. If you don't obey the Lord, it will not work out right. That's real simple, isn't it? Okay. Let's go on to the next thing. The Bible says the earth and everything in it, the world and its, once again we don't have the whole verse, but I don't know, but we don't, belongs to God. I'll give you the ending of it. It belongs to God, okay? Now, here's a, 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 a phrase we need to think about. Lord, empty me of me so I can be filled with you. Think about that a minute. How much of our time is focused on us? On me? We're all narcissistic. It's good to have a good self-esteem, good self-image, but not in a bad way. He says, see, if we don't have room for the Holy Spirit each day to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, if we're so full of ourselves, we don't have enough room for God's Spirit, what does it say about us? You know, you can't really have faith without the Spirit. You can't have power of the Spirit. You cannot serve Christ without the Spirit. And you can't have the Spirit unless you have the Son. So unless you're born again child of God, you can't have the power of God, the Spirit of God, the love of God, the direction of God, the healing of God, fulfillment of God, purpose of God. All those things are, are focused on the born again experience. So Lord, empty me of me so I can be filled with you. Had I rather be full of me or full of him? I better be wanting to be filled with Him. Not much about me worth being filled with, except Him. So, what do I really own? That's the third question. What do I really own? 
You say my house. No, the bank does. If you got your house paid off, praise God. It still belongs to God. Answer nothing. You are God's manager. A good way of telling your stewardship is look at your checkbook. Look at your debit card statement. Check your online banking. Where does your money go? The Bible says where your heart is, it's where your treasure is. Where your treasure is your heart to be. Now, I don't know about you, but think about it this way. God could ask for everything and we'd still give it. Because we're saved. I mean, if he said to me, Jim Shaw, you've got your salvation, so I want it all. Well, would I trade everything I have for my salvation? No. But God didn't say it. God says, I don't want it all. I want a portion of it because I'm going to let you have the majority of it. That's better than the government. <laughs> the government doesn't let you keep the majority of it, right? They spend on, on wonderful things like $800 hammers. Now, we are managers of everything God's given to us, okay? Look at the next thing. On the first day of the week, each of you is set to something aside as he has prospered, so no collection he needs to be made when I come. Paul's writing the church of Corinth. He's trying to raise an offering for the church in Jerusalem because they're hurting financially. Here's the mother church hurting financially. Paul says, take an offering on the first day of the week. Now, I want, I want to ask you a question. Why do Christians have worship on Sunday? Tuesday night, Monday morning. Why Sunday? Each day should be a day of worship. But Sunday is the first day of the week. Sunday begins the week. is Resurrection Day. Therefore, the church has taken that day for their regular worship around the world. Unlike other religions, the faith of Christianity worships on Sunday. Because it's the Lord's Day, Resurrection Day. And from that time, that's when the church began, the most part, worshiping on Sunday. Now, you're supposed to worship every day. Are y'all with me this morning? You still awake? Still excited? Yeah. Huh? Punch the person next to you and say, no, don't hurt them. Say, I'm glad you're here today. And I'm so glad you're listening. Y'all about as excited as a can of sardines. Come on, get with the program here, guys. I know you're just popping up and down inside. I know you are. Now, here's what I want you to think about. What price did it take for Christ's resurrection? Talk about stewardship. How good a steward was the Father? Pretty good. Sinless life, vicarious death, glorious resurrection. For you and me. So God has proven his stewardship in that he was a proper manager of all his resources. And the greatest resource he had was himself. He gave himself for us. So, why do Christians worship on Sunday? Because that's Resurrection Day. But we should worship every day of the week. You say, oh, you may come here a week, every day? No. You don't have to have everybody with you. Just praise the Lord. Read the scriptures. Shout hallelujah. Sing more than this in your shower. You all can make a joyful noise, right? Yeah. And let me tell you something else. If you listen to people, you're going around around you, wherever you are, just listen to people. You're going to hear some weird stuff. You're going to hear some strange things, you know? I mean, I have people that I listen to sometimes. I'm walking through a store or something. And, and, and I, I had a lady yesterday. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I just run into kind of strange people. Strange people, I guess, attract strange people. And, uh, Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, she said, I was going out the door. She said, the big department store. She said, this is not the right door. I said, what door are you looking for? She said, the other one. <laughs> I said, well, I'm sure if you look around, you'll find it, you know. I love people. They're so they're so funny. They really are. They don't know they're funny sometimes. That's why when you laugh at them, they get kind of offended. But they are funny. People are funny. They say stuff you can't believe they're going to say stuff like that, you know. Uh, so, 
at least I transgress here. Okay. So finally, the big verse. The verse has killed more church members in the century than anything else. They don't care what you preach. Just don't preach about money. <clears throat> well, I got news for you. Christ talked more about hell than about heaven. He talked a lot about money. Because he knew as human beings, it was hard for us to prioritize our stuff. You know, I've got a lot of treasure in my garage. <clears throat> as most you men do. Some might vary to call it stuff. Some might vary to call it junk. I call it treasure. And we're going to have a treasure yard sale here for long in the fall. My wife gets back. And I'm pulling things out. I know she's going to put back. <laughs> Don't you tell her I said that. I've been going through pictures. Oh my goodness, I found pictures like crazy. I found a picture where Jamie Faye and Stephen got engaged. Uh, I had that snapshot. You know, you go through pictures, and, and, and here's what I say to myself. Holy cow, what happened to me? Because I've changed a little bit, a little bit. Lead a bit. Pictures are a wonderful thing. And I've had pictures of me since I was a little boy on up to where I'm a big boy. I got all kind of, what are you laughing at? I'm, I got all kind of pictures. And those pictures bring back a memory, don't they? Your pictures bring back a memory. Some pictures we don't like. Ugh. I used to be a lot heavier, believe it or not. <laughs> Harry, I know you want to laugh, but you're holding it in. Go ahead. <laughs> I used to be the Hindenburg. No kidding. I, you could put an H on my stomach and I could have been floating over ball games. I was that big. So I've lost weight. Oh, yeah. And so I like looking at those pictures because I say to myself, who is that whale? And I thought, oh, that's me. But I've lost weight. But I want you to know what this says. In Malachi 3.10 it says, bring the full 10%. Let's stop there. What does that mean? 10%. What does it really mean, 10%? What does it really mean, 10%? See how easy this is? God does easy math. When I teach school, sometimes we have medical math class. And that is for people that have a little difficulty with math. I don't like teaching math. I don't like trigonometry. I don't like geometry. I like Jethro Bodine ciphering. <laughs> See, Shelby, you understand it because we're not even going to say where we're from. Y'all know who Jethro Bodine is? On the Beverly Hillbillies? I know that. My gosh, got to educate you folks. He said he was good at ciphering. I can add like crazy. I can do multiplication, addition, you name it, I can add it. If you want some change back, I can count it out for you. Well, I'll tell you right now, if the electricity goes off at of Walmart, you ain't getting your change back. <laughs> oh, my soul and body. And that's true. Anything has a cash register. If you want to really throw somebody off, your item is $10 a half, give them a $20 bill and a 5 cent piece. Oh, man. But people say funny things. Okay? Now, God says, this is what God says. Do we believe God? Hello? Do we believe God? I'm gonna, we're going to be here in a two hours. If you don't believe God, I go back to the beginning of the book of Genesis. Bring the full 10% into the storehouse. Now, wait a minute. Pastor, that's Old Testament. No, that's Bible. We, we don't pick and choose what we believe. We believe the whole thing. Storehouses where the products were kept so worship could happen in the temple. Let me repeat that. In the storehouse is where they kept the products, a lot of things they had to have, worship to have in the temple. So he says, bring the timber sent to my ministry, to my temple, to my work, okay? Now, God wants us to have simple math. I was teaching a math class one day, and the kid said, uh, Dr. Shaw, I've got a question. How, how do you divide this? And I thought, oh, oh, man, I can shine here because I can do long division like crazy. I was taught that in school, long division. 
So I went to the, to the I didn't go to the blackboard. I went to the, where they got, smart board, magic board, some kind of, yeah, thank you. And I said, okay. And I put that little bracket there, and I put like 149, and then divide by 7. And I went through all that. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm, I'm dividing. He said, we don't divide like that. I said, we mean about like that. I, I said, come show me. He went through a hydroglyphic <laughs> that I couldn't read off the wall. I mean, he put all the he spent like five or ten minutes on the same problem. He said, that's how we're taught to do it. I said, well, you're taught wrong. <laughs> this is how you do it. So I can't wait for that teacher to come back the next day. She spent six months teaching me. And said, oh, that shall show us the easy way of doing this. <laughs> God says, bring the full 10%. Easy figure. $100, 10 bucks. $200, 20 bucks. $300, 30 bucks. $400, you get the picture. God made it real simple. Now, God could say, give me 100%. What are we going to do? Not give it and not be blessed? He says, give me 10%, you can keep 90. Now, I can tell you by testimony, I've done it both ways. I've been a tither, I've not been a tither throughout my life. And tither is the way to go. You can do more than 9%, you can 100%. It's called spiritual multiplication. God will take that 9% and bless it through faith and give you a blessing you cannot hold. He promises that. A bless you can't hold if you'll trust Him. It's, about, it's not about money. It's about faith. Trusting God. He said, so there'll be food in my house. Test me in this way, says the Lord, that I'll give you a bless you cannot hold. Now, question five. Why do I have to tithe? Good question. Why do I have to tithe? 10% of what I earn. You know, if you think about this, if you make a million dollars a year, you give $100,000 to God. If you make $10,000 a year, you give $1,000 to God. John D. Rockefeller, the multimillionaire, was a Baptist and a tither. And he asked him one time, well, how can you tithe in all your means? He said, because I began tithing my mother's apron strings, giving a dime on the first dollar I got. This works, guys. I'm telling you now, I have never heard a tither complain about money. Amen. Because God will bless you far greater than you think. If you don't believe me, try it for a month. If you didn't work, you can come back and tell me. I've never had anybody come back and say, Well, oh, I tithe for a month and God didn't bless me. He said, It won't work like that. It will work. He will bless you. Now, you don't give to get. Harry mentioned a while ago about this pie in the sky type stuff. We're not talking about that. You don't give to get, but when you do give, you do get. It's all about your motivation. Now, question five once again. Why do I tithe? Number one, because God's Word tells us to. That seems simple, doesn't it? God's Word tells us to. Number two, helps our faith to grow. When, when, you, when you're a young couple, and I've been there, I understand, and you got bills and groceries and babies and children, and you say, well, how in the world can I do that? I can't hardly make it now. Yes, you can. If you'll trust God and put that 10% off the top... If you had to put an envelope, like Dave Ramsey talks about, take that $10 out of the first hundred, put an envelope, and you'll never miss it. But when you don't give back to God, you will miss it. You say, what do you mean? Well, let's take, for example, your child's well that week. <coughs> God blessed you. How much would it cost if you had to go to the doctor? How much would that cost? Tire didn't blow out. How much does that cost? Now, I'm not saying there's a balance sheet like that, but we sometimes forget about how we're being blessed by the Lord of the unforeseen tragedy that could happen. How, how about if you have something that's catastrophic? Don't you want God involved? <coughs> I talked to a young man this, last, this month, not in this city, another city, called me. Worried about money. Worried about going bankrupt. Had a couple businesses, various things. And I said, well, are you, are you making enough money each month? Yeah. Are you paying your bills? Yeah. You got money left over? Yeah. So why are you, why are you worried? I said, I'll tell you why you're worried. Because you're leaving God out. He said, well, what if I have a catastrophe? I said, what if you do? You think God's going to let you be on your own for the catastrophe and he hasn't let you be alone and everything else? 
If you trust the Lord with your life, not your finances, not your time, not your talent, if you trust Him with your life, He will not depart from you. Three, it brings us a promised blessing. Anybody ever been lied to by God? He said, I'll bring you a blessing. He will. You know what's a great blessing to have? Mental peace. Peace of heart. Peace of life. My wife uh, always does our bills. Until recently. And she left for Arizona. God bless her. Now I'm doing all the bills. Boy, it's a big job. And I, I, I am so nervous because she had it so, so laid out. I was almost afraid to touch it. But she had everything organized and packets and envelopes. and It was like a mini Dave Ramsey. It was like everything was laid out there, you know. And I'm doing that. I'm doing it. I'm doing it pretty well, I might say. Do, not bragging about me, but yeah, I guess I am. I'm doing a pretty good job with that. But I'm telling you, if I don't do it correctly... I got a problem. Twofold problem. Number one, with God. Number two, with God's assistant, Christine. <laughs> She's going to burn. No, she won't burn. But I'm telling you, she did all the time. And I have a great appreciation of that now because I'm writing these bills and all that kind of stuff, you know. If your wife does the bills, God bless you, fellas. You better pray for her every day she don't get sickness in her hand and she can't write a check. <laughs> and I am so proud of myself. But here's what I do know. That tithe's going to come out of there. I tithe my American Express every Sunday. Will I get a check or not? I'm still tithing. Why? Well, first of all, I believe in this church. Second of all, I believe in God. And guess what? God has not let one bill go unpaid. I got money in the bank, and God's blessed me and my wife, my family. And I praise God for that. I didn't get a check the first six months of this year, this church. Didn't miss a single bill. Not one single bill. Now, my wife's helped me a lot working in various things. We've worked together. And the only thing I'm trying to say to you is this your $10 is important. Your heart all is important. Your thought all is important. It's not a matter how much you give. It's not equal gifts. It's equal sacrifice. Bring the entire tithe. You don't give that tithe to Uncle Joe or Aunt Betsy. You give that tithe to the Lord through His church. I told you, young man, I said, what you need to do this Sunday is write that tithe check to God. Put Him first in your life. He'll take away your fear, your worry, your nervousness. God will never let you down. Does that mean you won't face bad stuff? No. Do you mean you may, may have some financial problems? No, I don't mean that. What it means is you're, inv you're investing yourself in God's plan. You're saying, God, you help me. You work with me. I want to live my life with you. So hadn't you rather have God work out your plan of your life than yourself? Number four, God's financial plan for your life, <clears throat> life His church. I have preached some messages I felt like E.F. Hutton in reverse. When I spoke, nobody listened. You can read John Maxwell, Dave Ramsey, anybody else on the list, you want to read. I'm telling you right now, God's Word is the best book. If you want to be in the best financial plan, in these days of low interest rates and low stock returns, invest in God. That's the best return you can ever have. It really is. And teach your children to tithe. When I was a little boy, my mom and daddy, every Saturday night, my daddy never made much money at all. I don't remember him ever making more $100 a week. But every Saturday night, they got their checkbook out and wrote that tie for the church, put in the envelope, and took it to Sunday school. Every single payday. They did okay. So teach your children about stewardship, about being good managers, about serving and worshiping and loving God. So when they get grown up, they won't have eight or nine or ten thousand dollars debt like most Americans do. We are a debtor nation. Everybody's credit crazy. 
A college student receiving a credit card in the mail with a $10,000 open line is nuts. They don't have a job, but they got a credit card. When they charge that credit card up, who do you think is going to pay for it? <laughs> hey, Dad. How you doing? Pretty good. So good to hear from you, son or daughter. What you need? $10,000. <laughs> Teach them good habits. By the way, don't teach them because you say so. Teach them by your example. <laughs> Alright, finally, number five. God set the pattern with Jesus, except God gave us his all. 100%, 110%. Have you seen that commercial on TV where it talks about 110%? The little guy jumps out. He's a 10%. The guy says uh, he's a little bit nervous. He had a thimble full of coffee. <laughs> you seen it? Okay, well, you don't watch TV. Alright. Finally. Jesus paid it all. Isaiah 53, 5. Salvation is not being in debt to God. It's being debt free. Because of God. Our sin debt was paid by Christ on the cross. He paid a price we couldn't pay. And we owed a debt that we couldn't pay. And He paid it all for us. This morning, I can't help but thank that little dog being free in my yard. Boy, he was so happy. He was just, just, he was beside himself. Bouncing all around, a little dog, probably way more, about two pounds. He was bouncing the grass, just having a great time. In fact, he thought he's a big dog. Aww. Yeah, he thought he's a big dog. You a big dog? You bounce around for God? Do you feel secure in Him? You ready to meet Him one day? He says, let's look at the balance sheet here. Why didn't you obey me of a stewardship? What is your justification? Uh, no. God loves us so much. He gave us all for us. And He wants you to lovingly give to Him. If you give begrudgingly, you might as well keep it home. God loves a what? Cheerful. Cheerful giver. That means hilarious. <laughs> you got to laugh when you give. <laughs> You gotta, you gotta be nuts to serve Christ fully. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> My job is to try to become a crackpot. I'm almost there. A crackpot is a broken vessel where the spirit flows out of you, life of somebody else. And don't brag about your giving. To let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. Only thing that matters is what God knows. And when God is, and when you're being faithful to God, God will say to you. Well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's all the pound the back we need, what God thinks. Father God, we come today in Jesus' name.